Well, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure for me to get to introduce my friend and colleague, Martin Indyk. I think Martin is one of the foremost experts in the entire country on some of the challenges we face in global affairs. Uh, he's especially uh, expert and interested in uh, Middle East uh, stability and uh, Southeast uh, Asia, amongst other things. A uh, little bit personal, uh, on the personal side, he was born in London, he was educated in Australia, and he emigrated to the U.S. in 1982. Uh, he has headed the foreign policy program at uh, Brookings, and for his sins uh, in that job, he has now been promoted to be the executive vice president of Brookings. In case you're wondering what that position entails, I will simply tell you it's like being the lion tamer at the circus. Uh, Martin and I have some incredibly impressive colleagues, but some of them, I have to tell you, have claws. Uh, in 2013-14, uh, Martin took a leave of absence from Brookings to serve as U.S. Special Envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And for those of you who happen to have attended our seminar on drones, I was interested to read that in the framework agreement that was presented at that time, there was talk of unmanned aerial vehicles, presumably to monitor uh, the proposed borders. Uh, Martin has also served as our ambassador to Israel, actually not once, but twice. And I also want um, to welcome his wife, who is here with him. Her name is uh, Gail Burt, and she has many interests, but uh, prominent among them, she's vice chair of the American Academy in uh, Berlin. And in keeping with Seminar's own commitment to always being nonpartisan and objective, I can tell you that they are a bipartisan couple. He served in the Clinton administration and she served uh, in the Reagan administration. Now, I think this is an incredibly important uh, moment in foreign affairs, and we're very, very lucky to have Martin here. Not only is Congress negotiating the Iran deal, but a faltering Chinese economy caused our own stock market to plummet today, and Russia has become much more aggressive in recent years, is threatening Eastern Europe. ISIS is doing all kinds of horrible things, as you know. So in general, I'm just very pleased that we have someone as distinguished as Martin uh, to talk to us today. So please join me in welcoming him to Steamboat. G'day. Uh, uh, Gail and I are delighted to be with you today. Uh, we had a delightful drive uh, from Aspen uh, this afternoon where we're staying with our family for the end of summer. Uh, I'm kind of awestruck at the thought that so many of you would decide to give up such a beautiful evening to come and hear in particular about the Middle East. But uh, Stranger things have happened in my life, so I'm very glad to be with you tonight. Uh, Bell and I uh, will be heading back to Brookings uh, and Washington uh, after Labor Day, and it promises to be an eventful fall in Washington, where politics, of course, prevails over everything else. Uh, the Donald Trump reality show, um, the Hillary email saga, a potential uh, run which looks increasingly likely now by Joe Biden. But the hottest issue in town will surely be uh, the Iran deal. Uh, and the least likely issue to attract any attention at all will be the thing that I've spent 35 years of my life on, which is trying to bring peace to Israel and its Arab neighbors, particularly Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, Bill su Bell suggested that I speak about both tonight, the one that's hot and the one that's not. 
And I thought it might be useful to analyze how the two are actually connected. First of all, the Iran deal. I, I wonder if you would uh, allow me to ask you a question uh, to start with. Uh, how many of you uh, support the Iran deal? And how many are opposed to the Iran deal? And how many haven't made up their minds? So actually, yes. Well, it's, so I guess, from my uh, quick head count, it slightly leans towards uh, uh, supporting the Iran deal, but it's fairly evenly divided. And that, uh, I think, captures uh, the nature of the deal itself. It is controversial, um, and it is uh, by no means uh, a clear-cut issue. Uh, I will tell you, uh, in uh, fairness, all fairness, that I support the, the Iran deal, but I want tonight to uh, do my best to try to dissect it uh, objectively, uh, and to also try to explain to you why uh, even though uh, I uh, have my problems with the deal, I still think, on balance, it's better to have it than not. And the thing that really uh, informs uh, my judgment about that is the fact that uh, this is the most consequential development in the Middle East probably since the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt and the revolution there. A region that has only known wars and revolution since then, and no better example of that can be found than the rise of ISIS, uh, is suddenly nevertheless being reminded that there are other ways to settle differences in this region that is so beset by conflicts. And that is through diplomacy, through promoting negotiated compromises that by definition have to take both sides' minimum requirements into account. Otherwise, you can't have a negotiated deal. My life has been spent in diplomatic negotiation, so that's why I feel kind of strongly about it. And it's worth remembering in this context that there hasn't been a negotiated deal in the Middle East, uh, certainly not one led by the United States, for 17 years. Uh, the last one, does anybody know what it was? No, that was actually after Jimmy Carter's Camp David agreement with, with Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin. No, it was the Y Plantation Agreement that Bill Clinton negotiated at the Y River Plantation outside of Washington in Maryland with Yasser Arafat, Bibi Netanyahu, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, that provided for the withdrawal of uh, Israeli uh, forces and presence from 13% of the West Bank. And that was the last agreement uh, we've had in the Middle East, negotiated by the United States. I happen to have the honor of being part of that team that negotiated that agreement. As Bell said, I've also been involved more recently in the last forlorn attempt to negotiate an Israeli-Palestinian final status uh, agreement, uh, which uh, ended in ignominy uh, last year. Uh, but essentially, it's a sad story that we haven't been able, in this volatile region, to use diplomacy effectively to uh, deal with the complicated uh, conflicts that arise there. And this Iran deal represents just that, a negotiated deal over one of the most problematic uh, issues in the region, which is Iran's march towards a nuclear weapon. And the purpose of this uh, agreement is to try to ensure that Iran is never able to acquire nuclear weapons. 
That's important uh, in its own right because preventing other countries from acquiring nuclear weapons has been a high priority, not just of the United States, but of the international community since the Non-Proliferation Treaty was actually negotiated. And Bob Stein, your chair, uh, was telling me that he was on the American team involved in the negotiation of the, of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, where the United States played the critical role there. Uh, so it's important to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons, but it's particularly important in the Middle Eastern context, where were Iran to acquire nuclear weapons, uh, one of two things would happen. Either uh, there would be a nuclear arms race as uh, the Iran's neighbors in the region, uh, particularly on the Arabian side of the Gulf, uh, would uh, seek their own nuclear weapons uh, to counter Iran. And of course, Israel, which is being threatened on a fairly regular basis by the Iranian regime uh, with its destruction, uh, would also not stand idly by while Iran acquired nuclear weapons. So in the context of a highly volatile Middle East with all of its conflicts, whether it's the Arab-Israeli conflict or it's, it's the uh, Sunni Shia sectarian conflict or the, the civil war in Syria or the war between the Saudis and the Houthis in Yemen and so on. All of those conflicts would become immensely more dangerous if added to that was a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. So that's why it's important uh, to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, it's not surprising that when we look at this kind of deal, it's highly controversial. Uh, that's because it's a deal with our enemy. As President Obama is fond of saying, you make peace with your enemies, not with your friends. And it's true that we've had many arms control uh, agreements, particularly with the Soviet Union, when we were in the midst of a Cold War and the Soviet Union was our principal adversary. So the idea of reaching an agreement with an adversary, in this case an adversary that caused the United States the great Satan, and in regular demonstrations after Friday sermons in which the leader, uh, the supreme leader, as he's called, the Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, preaches, uh, as you know, the death to America, death to Israel is the chant. Um, and there is uh, clearly, if you look at the most recent statement by Ayatollah Khamenei, no uh, reduction whatsoever in his enmity towards the United States. And necessarily, that makes people feel like, you know, uh, it's not such a great idea to be doing a deal with somebody who wants to kill you. <laughs> um, but it's better to, to do a deal if it means that the somebody who wants to kill you doesn't have nuclear weapons. <laughs> and that's the essential uh, justification, but it's essentially why it's controversial. Uh, and it's particularly controversial for Israel because of this constant uh, refrain coming out of the regime, out of the supreme leader himself in particular, calling for the destruction of Israel. Uh, so what, what's in the deal that makes it worthwhile in these circumstances, especially what makes it worthwhile, given that, as part of the deal, the international sanctions which have been crippling the Iranian economy will all be lifted, provided that Iran fulfills its obligations under this agreement. And particularly because the deal, if Iran implements its side of, of the agreement, 
uh, will lead to all of its frozen assets uh, being released. And that will give the Iranians a windfall of some 100 to 150 billion dollars in unfrozen assets. Now, the administration, the Secretary of the Treasury, says that some 50 billion dollars of that is already committed, so it's, maybe it's 100 billion, nobody knows for sure. But it will be a windfall for the Iranian regime. What do we get in return? under this deal. Commitments from Iran never to build nuclear weapons. And because we can't believe them, <laughs> given their history of lying and cheating when it comes to commitments they had already made under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the agreement also provides for a monitoring and verification regime, the most intrusive in the history of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to detect any cheating and thereby, because of, of the nature of the inspection and monitoring that will take place, to deter Iran from trying to cheat. Uh, in this context, some of you may have followed uh, the issue of what the actual regime of verification and monitoring involves. All of Iran's nuclear program will be under 24-7 monitoring. That is to say, from the, the uh, mine head where the uranium ore is uh, dug out of the ground, to the processing point, to the fabrication point, to the centrifuge enrichment point, to their nuclear reactors, to come back to in a moment, uh, to the stockpiles of uh, enriched uranium, all of that will be monitored 24-7. And that will continue in, in uh, all of those cases for 25 years. Uh, and so that in itself gives some assurance that uh, they're not going to be able to cheat because you can't build a nuclear weapon unless you have all of these things functioning to the point where you've actually enriched enough uh, fissile material for a nuclear uh, device. Uh, so that part of the deal is reassuring. What is creating real concerns amongst critics of the deal and people who haven't yet made up their mind is that the Iranians could well conduct activities outside of that known nuclear program. They did it once. They built Fordo, this underground uh, centrifuge plant that uh, was built in secret uh, and they only fessed up to it after Western intelligence communities had discovered it and uh, they realized that they'd been caught. Uh, so that is the question, is how do we know what they're going to be doing covertly? How will we prevent that from happening? Uh, and some in the, in the Obama administration unwisely said, well, we'll deal with that by having anywhere, anytime inspections. But the deal itself doesn't provide for anywhere, anytime inspections. It provides for the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to go anywhere they want, but they can be stopped by the Iranians. And if they are, because it's a sovereign country, you know, uh, we wouldn't like international inspectors going out to our military sites and inspecting what we've got there. Uh, if they're stopped by the Iranians, then there is a process by which they uh, have to uh, justify stopping the inspection. The inspectors have to justify undertaking the inspection. And that process can uh, be drawn out for 24 days. I won't go into all the details of why it's 24 days. Uh, but there will be a process in which 
even the sensitive sites can be inspected and if Iran refuses, then there is a mechanism to go back to the Security Council and reimpose sanctions on Iran. But it's, it's a process that is more intrusive than any other a regime that's, that's been negotiated for any other uh, signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But because it was set up as an expectation that they could go anywhere, anytime, critics of the deal say 24 days is just you know, too long. They'll be able to hide it, they'll be able to uh, cheat, and we won't uh, be able to find it. Um, there is some truth to that, but they can't hide a program that will produce nuclear, enough nuclear material for a nuclear bomb because that requires big infrastructure. And we're watching them, not just the inspectors, but the intelligence communities that discovered the one that they were building secretly uh, long before, two years before they fessed up to it. So even though it, it's a problem, I don't believe that it's a critical uh, problem. Uh, the agreement also provides for sanctions to be reimposed. This is known as the snapback. And uh, people are very skeptical that sanctions once lifted could actually be reimposed. But if you read the details of the agreement, you will see that the United States has introduced, with support of Russia uh, and the Europeans, a, uh, an arrangement uh, for reimposing sanctions in the Security Council that the United States can actually do unilaterally. The other permanent members of the Security Council under this arrangement have given up their right to veto. So that if the United States is sufficiently concerned about uh, what Iran is doing, uh, it can uh, simply vote against, use its veto to vote against the continuation of the suspension of the sanctions in a resolution at the, in the Security Council and the sanctions will be reimposed. Uh, will every country that's involved after the sanctions have been lifted in doing business with Iran be willing to reimpose those sanctions? It's a question mark. Uh, it will take a lot of diplomacy and it will of course depend on the uh, ex extent of the uh, charge that the United States or with our allies uh, we make against the Iranians. It depends on what they will be doing. And there is the related problem that Iran uh, has said and in fact has the right under the agreement to basically say, okay, if you're reimposing sanctions, we're not going to live up to any part of the agreement that we had previously agreed to. Which means that it becomes a kind of all or nothing thing and, you know, will the United States be ready to reimpose sanctions if it's a minor infringement? How major does it have to be before we, in effect, have the breakdown of the agreement? These are questions of conjecture. Uh, it, the agreement also winds back Iran's current nuclear program. Its centrifuges it has 19,000 of them now, will be taken down to 5,000 first generation, old centrifuges, not particularly sophisticated, take a lot of time to enrich uranium. The stockpile of enriched uranium, which it had uh, already enriched up to 20%, uh, enough for nine bombs if they took it with their centrifuges to 90% or more, uh, which they could do relatively quickly, uh, that stockpile will have to be reduced under this agreement to, to a number of kilograms much below what is needed for one nuclear uh, device. And as I said, that will be under constant inspection and monitoring. They will have to take that underground 
centrifuge establishment and reconfigure it so it can't be used to enrich uranium. And they will have to take their Arak heavy water nuclear, power, uh, nuclear plant, which they're building now, and reconfigure it such that it will not be able to produce plutonium and they will never have the ability to reprocess what it produces to be able to try to go the North Korean route, which is what the North Koreans did after they signed an agreement with the United States. So they went the plutonium route, which was a much faster route to a nuclear weapon. Well, the Iranians have no way of doing that forever under, under this agreement. Uh, and so the purpose of these additional uh, commitments on the part of the Iranians is to, in effect, wind back the clock. Today, the Iranians are something like three months from the bomb. Three months from having enough nuclear material to construct a bomb. Under this agreement, they will be one year. They'll be, because of the way that their centrifuges will be taken down, their stockpiles will be taken down and so on, they will be more than one year away from being able to construct a bomb. So uh, that's the essence of the deal. It sounds to me like a reasonable bargain if you bear in mind that those assets that become the windfall for Iran are actually Iran's assets that the international sanctions were imposed because Iran was not in compliance with its non-proliferation treaty obligations, and this agreement will bring it into compliance with its NPT obligations. So the sanctions have to be lifted in that context. Our sanctions for Iran's sponsorship of terrorism and Iran's uh, uh, human rights policies, all of those sanctions will remain on. In any, in any, if there's anybody in the audience who's planning to go to Tehran to do business there, I would say don't waste your time because our sanctions will not be lifted and they will not allow US corporations to do business uh, with Iran, regardless of the international sanctions being lifted that are related to this nuclear deal. But the rest of the world is rushing to Tehran these days, uh, anxious to take advantage of a, of a market that's been closed to them uh, for so many years and to take advantage of Iran's windfall uh, uh, in terms of the assets it might have to rebuild its economy. Uh, so that's essentially uh, the, the, the outlines of the deal. But there are other problems with it. Uh, and we need to uh, confront them. Uh, the first is that the uh, arrangements for controlling uh, Iran's production of nuclear material and its centrifuges and uh, its stockpiles, uh, all of those things will go away after 15 years. They will still be under their obligations of the Non-Proliferation Treaty not to develop nuclear weapons. They'll still be under inspection, intrusive inspections that have been agreed to here and monitoring. But they will be able to uh, build a full cycle new, uh, civilian nuclear program. And the problem there is after 15 years, the ability to cross over from a civilian nuclear program to a nuclear weapons program goes back to about three months, maybe even less than that, uh, once they get their sophisticated centrifuges up and running. And so after 15 years, Iran won't be under sanctions and will have an internationally approved civilian nuclear fuel cycle which, if they chose to break out, would enable them to go for a nuclear weapon uh, down the road. And that's why, I, in my view, we're all faced with a choice here. It's not a particularly comfortable choice, but it has to be made. In particular, every senator and congressman is being asked to vote on this deal. 
And the choice is between an Iran that is nuclear weapons free for 15 years at least, but under no sanctions, uh, nuclear related sanctions, versus an Iran that is three months from a nuclear bomb under eroding sanctions. And why do I say eroding sanctions? It's because if we walk away from the deal now, the deal that we negotiated with the uh, consensus support of the five permanent members of security, four other, four other permanent members of the Security Council, plus, plus the EU and, and Germany, if we now walk away from a deal which they've also negotiated and signed up to, they will feel under no obligation to continue to uphold the sanctions. Uh, if Iran fulfills its part of the deal, those sanctions internationally will be lifted by the UN Security Council. And so we will not be able to hold our, our partners in this deal to that. That's why I say it's 15 years of a nuclear-free Iran with no sanctions versus an Iran three months from a nuclear, having enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon under eroding sanctions. And those who say we should walk away and negotiate a better deal have to explain how you get a better deal when the sanctions that you used as leverage to get this deal are going to be weaker than they were in this case. So it's, it seems to me the alternative is a fairly dubious proposition. Uh, so that's one, one problem, though, is what happens after 15 years. And that relates to the second uh, problem with it, which is that there is nothing in this deal that addresses Iran's highly problematic behavior in its region its support for terrorism. It's on the State Department's terrorism list as the foremost state sponsor of terrorism. Its support for Hezbollah, uh, for the Shia militias in Iraq, for the Houthis in Yemen. Its efforts to establish uh, its dominance in the Middle Eastern Sunni heartland through its proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Assad regime in Syria, the uh, Iraqi uh, Shia regime in Baghdad that is essentially under its thumb, and now in Yemen with the Houthis that are taking over, have taken over Sana'a, the capital there. Uh, and that uh, comes on top of what I referred to before as their persistent effort to uh, weaken Israel to support proxies like Hezbollah and Hamas to make war on Israel, and of course to threaten to destroy Israel. And this agreement doesn't address any of those issues. Why not? Because it's an agreement about Iran's nuclear program. Iran, in the secret negotiations that laid the groundwork for this agreement, which took place in Oman between US and Iranian officials. The Iranians sought to introduce all of these issues onto the table. They said, let's do a full deal encompassing all of these other issues that you're concerned about in terms of what's going on in the region. And the United States, the Obama administration, took a decision that they weren't going to do that. Why? because it would enable the Iranians to play all sorts of cards, regional cards, to weaken the demands that we needed to have met when it came to the actual nuclear program. And there was a second reason. Because our Arab allies and Israel all said to us for years now, don't you dare discuss these regional issues when we're not at the table, because they affect us, not just you. So that's why it wasn't in the deal. Uh, you can criticize the deal for not dealing with it, but you need to at least understand that there are pretty good reasons for not having it in the deal. 
Which leads me to the final point in the segue to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And that is that uh, 15 years of a non-nuclear Iran may seem to some like a blink of an eye, but it's a long time in terms of what we, the United States, and our allies in the region, starting with Israel, but also with our Arab allies, what we can all do together to deal with Iran's behavior in the region, to take advantage of the fact that we're not going to have a nuclear arms race in the region, to start to deal with the really difficult problems that Iran's behavior is presenting. And in that context, we should not build Iran up as being some kind of giant dominating the region. They are supporting the most brutal regime in the Middle East today, the Assad regime in Damascus. That makes them highly unpopular in the Sunni world that they would seek to dominate. And that regime that they are backing in Syria is going down. It's always going to take longer than you expect, but it is going down. It is losing. And if Iran loses the Assad regime, it loses its position of influence in the northern part of the Middle East heartland. Syria and Lebanon and Hezbollah is in deep trouble at that point. And so its primary position of influence in the, in the Sunni Arab world becomes rather tenuous at that point. It hasn't happened yet, but the notion that Iran is on a roll across the region is far-fetched. It's backing the Shias in these different places, or the Alawites that are associated with the Shias, and they are minority regimes. Uh, and so they're not going to be able to dominate the region. They can cause a lot of trouble. They play within the cracks in the regimes. They take advantage of the failure of, of uh, the Sunni Arab regimes to meet the fundamental needs of their people or to suppress their people. Then the Iranians are very good at, at exploiting that discontent. But in the end, they run up against the wall that they are pushing a sectarian agenda in a Sunni-dominated Middle East. Uh, and so there are strict limits to how far it can go with this game. It will hold in, in uh, Baghdad, courtesy of the United States government, uh, because there's a Shia majority in Baghdad which they have uh, dominance over. Uh, but anywhere else, it really becomes questionable over time. So there's a lot that can be done in 15 years to deal with those problems, free of the threat of a nuclear arms race. Uh, and that's what we will need to do. Uh, one of the things that comes out of this is that Iran has become so threatening to Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the other Arab monarchs that there is now a virtual alliance between Israel and many of the countries that were enemies or supported its enemies in the past in the Arab world. And that virtual alliance is very real today. It's tangible. Why? Because they share common enemies. You've all heard that line about in the Middle East, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that's what's happening. However, it cannot be forged into a full-fledged, out-of-the-closet alliance unless Israel and the Palestinians resolve their conflict. Because as long as the Palestinians continue under Israeli occupation, countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and, and uh, Qatar and... and, and uh, uh, Jordan, well, Jordan's made peace with Israel, of course, but all of them find it very difficult to work with Israel in, against their common enemy, Iran, 
to work openly with Israel in circumstances where the Palestinian problem has not been resolved. So at the moment, that conflict is in a kind of quiet phase. It won't stay that quiet for long. It already bubbles up with incidents of terrorism from time to time. The potential for another war in Gaza is always there. It seems to happen every two years. Uh, but it's not exactly on the front burner, as I said, at, uh, at the outcome. But in the context of taking advantage of this deal to build a, uh, a strong American-backed alliance in the region between Israel and its Arab neighbors to counter Iran's uh, nefarious agenda, in that context, uh, it might be possible. At least it's worth exploring the potential for these Arab states to come in and act as the custodians for the Palestinians, to support the Palestinians, to act as the anchor in a way that they haven't up till now. They've been happy to leave the Palestinians to do their own thing, which has been unproductive. And, but in that context of a threat from Iran that concentrates their minds and builds their common interest, it may actually make it easier to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and thereby create a basis for stabilizing this deeply unstable part of the world. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, Do you want to and, uh, use the microphone? Yeah. <coughs> um, so the questions are coming in, but really, the, those of us who are in the front row were whispering to each other. That's a brilliant analysis of the, especially of the connections here. Um, first question is: Your analysis of the agreement seems very reasonable. If so, why is Netanyahu so opposed? Uh, that, that is a, a very good question. Um, it starts with what I was talking about. The fact that the Iranians, on a regular basis, like the Ayatollah gets up out of bed in the morning and, and says, you know, I'm going to announce today that I'm going to seek the destruction of Israel. So it, it, it's become a kind of mantra. And we can from Steamboat Springs say, well, they'll never actually do that. Look how far away they are from Israel. But if you're the Prime Minister of Israel, regardless of whether you're a right-wing or, or a, a left-wing Prime Minister, you are obliged to take those threats seriously. Certainly we would expect our President to take such threats seriously if we were faced with that situation. But it, on top of that, of course, Israel, as a Jewish state, is the inheritor of Jewish history, which is a history of destruction of the Jewish state in centuries past, and the oppression and the attempt to annihilate the Jewish people and not so long ago. So it adds a, a, a dimension to the threat that is uh, very concerning, not just for the Prime Minister of Israel, I would say for all Israelis. Uh, and they see it, not just in, in the speeches that come from Tehran, but in the provision by Iran of 50,000 uh, rockets in the hands of Hezbollah that can reach most of Israel's major centers of population. They see it in the way that Iran in the past, is not so much today, but in the past, Iran supported Hamas. Iran still supports Palestine Islamic Jihad. And these Palestinian terrorist organizations have caused an immense uh, amount of casualties uh, amongst Israelis. And the Iranians are behind that. They're sponsoring it. They're lauding it. Uh, and what's it their business? You know, I mean, look, they're at the other end of the Middle East. When Yasser Arafat decided to recognize Israel's right to exist, 
the Ayatollah issued a fatwa to assassinate him. How do we know this? Because Arafat told President Clinton at the time, I was in the room when he told him that, this, that he was under very real threat from Iran. Why? Because the Palestinians wanted to make peace with Israel. So there's good reason for the Israelis to be very concerned about this. And their margin of security is much less than ours. We have something like 5,000 nuclear weapons in our arsenal. Iran is not going to attack us. They're probably not going to attack Israel either, because rumor has it that, Iran, that Israel has certain capabilities as well. <laughs> but were they to have nuclear weapons, it would be a complete game changer for Israel's national security. And uh, the real concern that the Prime Minister has articulated is that with nuclear weapons, they will have immunity to do a lot more of what they've been doing that's created problems for Israel. So it's understandable. The way they see it from Jerusalem is different to the way, by definition, it's a structural difference between the way that the Prime Minister of Israel, any Prime Minister of Israel sees it, and the way the President of the United States sees it. But having said that, you know, the question is, what, what is the best way to deal with it? Is it best to have Iran three months from the bomb, and in, because we're walking away from this in pursuit of a so-called better deal, uh, in a situation in which uh, if Iran starts to try to break out, then we'll have only one option left, which is the military option. Or Israel will have to pursue the military option. And the military option, by all accounts, it's agreed the Israelis will agree to this too. The military option will buy Israel, the United States, the international community three years maximum because the Iranians know, have the know-how. And they will be under no obligations then. And there won't be international sanctions anymore under that arrangement. And they'll take their nuclear program underground just like Saddam Hussein did when the Israelis bombed his uh, Osirak uh, nuclear reactor. Uh, and so, you know, if that's, if that's the alternative, since I don't see a better, or, a better deal as an alternative, then we're left with a situation where it's kind of 15 years or three years. I'll take the 15 years. Some in Israel, including in their security establishment, also think that that's worth having. But the Prime Minister is, feels extremely strongly about this, has from the first time he was elected he has made this his primary issue of concern. And uh, as a consequence, uh, he is determined to try to prevent this deal from going through. I think that once we're through this, if the deal does go through, that we then have a special obligation, notwithstanding the way that the Prime Minister of Israel has behaved, which I have real problems with, Nevertheless, we, I believe we have an obligation because the deal will narrow Israel's margins of security. We have an obligation to work with Israel to expand them again. And I'll be happy to go into details if anybody wants to hear what that would involve. This question is about ISIS. Uh, and it's, can we or uh, is there any potential that we could work, that Iran and uh, the US could work together against ISIS? Uh, there is the potential, uh, it exists today in Iraq, where Iran uh, has control of Iraqi Shia militias that it has armed and trained and uh, uh, effectively controls them on the ground with Iranian commanders. Uh, and those uh, Shia militias are quite capable uh, of taking uh, ISIS on and, and have done so in, in the past. They cannot do it effectively without American air cover. 
So you might say, well, that sounds like a good arrangement. If they've got effective militias, we, can, we don't have a, a particularly effective Iraqi army now, and the Sunni militias, militias feel so betrayed by us that they're not exactly comfortable working with us. Um, so uh, let's work with the Shias uh, militias and with Iran. Uh, the problem with it is that we cannot defeat ISIS with Shia militias can only defeat ISIS with Sunnis, because it's a Sunni movement. We try to use the Shias to, to defeat ISIS, we will end up with a deepening Shia-Sunni sectarian war in Iraq. And uh, the Shias in places, the militias where they operated, were, were slaughtering uh, Sunnis uh, in much the same way as ISIS was doing. Uh, where they took control from ISIS. Uh, so it's, it's, it may sound tactically wise, strategically it's a huge uh, mistake in my view. Uh, is there any chance we could add or amend the deal as Richard Haas has suggested? Um, I don't think it's possible now to go back to the negotiating table uh, and try to uh, amend the deal. Uh, bear in mind the context in which we negotiated this deal. This wasn't a US-Iranian negotiation, although much of it was done in that bilateral fashion between Secretary of State Kerry and Foreign Minister of Iran, Zarif. But Kerry was operating in the context of five other world powers who were at the table. Uh, Russia, China, Britain, France, uh, and well, the EU and uh, Germany. Uh, and so they've signed up to this deal. Believe me, this debate is not happening in any other country except for Israel, in which there's not a lot of debate about it. They kind of made up, most of them have made up their minds. But, uh, you know, in Canada to the north here, there's, there's not a huge discussion about it. In Australia, in uh, uh, Europe, they see this as a deal that's worth doing. And so for us to come back and say, well, it's not good enough because our Congress won't, won't go along with it, uh, they're, they're not going to support us in that. So I don't think that it's realistic. I just don't see it. Uh, what I do think is realistic is for us to start to do things with our allies, like Israel, Arab states, and our European allies, to, ha to reach certain understandings about when we will snap back those sanctions, about perhaps uh, warning their corporations uh, not to be rushing in, uh, about uh, having understandings around terms of which we would uh, act even to the point of militarily. Uh, and in this case, to change our declaratory policy to make absolutely clear, and the President I think should do this, that if Iran cheats, all our options will be on the table, including the use of force in that regard. There are things that we can do to provide a deterrent umbrella over our allies that feel most threatened, Israel and our, our Arab allies. In other words, there are a whole range of things that we can do to complement and supplement the deal that will help to take care of some of the problematic parts of it. I recommend to you, if you're interested, to go on the Brookings website. This is a shameless act of, of uh, self-promotion. Uh, but it's not something I wrote. It's something that our colleague, uh, Bob Einhorn, wrote. Uh, he was a uh, part of the nuclear negotiating team in years uh, back. This negotiation has been going on for 10 years. Uh, and has been a counsellor to Wendy Sherman, so he knows all of these issues very well. And he has written a, an, an analytical piece about, about the six battleground issues, the six issues in, in contention, and then a, a series of recommendations along the lines that I've been uh, cribbing from him uh, on 
about what can be done to complement and supplement uh, the deal. So I strongly recommend you, you just Google Einhorn, E-I-N-H-O-R-N, and you'll, you'll find the link. This is such a serious discussion that I have to interject a lighter note for a moment. I Googled Martin's name today because I wanted to make sure on some facts before I introduced him, and up came his name in below, on Google, and below his name were a series of pictures. And any of you who've ever Googled someone's name, especially if the person is somewhat well-known, you'll know that's a standard thing. You see three or four pictures of the person you've just Googled. In Martin's case, all of the pictures are turkeys. <laughs> So Google Martin Indic, and you will see a lovely array of photographs of turkeys. <laughs> and Martin had to explain to me that the, he, first of all, he didn't know this. I showed it to him before we came over here. And he laughed loudly and long. And uh, then he explained to me that Indic is the uh, Polish word for turkey. <laughs> So I just assumed it was because some prankster thought he was a turkey. <laughs> uh, there are two related questions here. One is, uh, 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 says, I would appreciate a description of the Iran deal from the Iranian point of view. Why should they agree or disagree with it? Do you anticipate that they will sign on to it? And the uh, related question is how uh, aware is the public in Iran about the deal? What are their sentiments and uh, what do they have to gain from it? Um, yeah, very good question. Uh, it's obviously very difficult for me uh, to put myself in the shoes of, of the Iranian government or its negotiators, or its people. Uh, I've never been there. Uh, it's important to understand that even though I dealt with Iran, the Iran file, in um, six of the eight years in which I was uh, in the Clinton administration, uh, and that's why I'll never get to go to Iran. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we had no contact with Iranian officials for 30 years. There has been zero contact with Iranian officials at the official level until that secret negotiation began in Oman a couple of years ago. Uh, so being able to feel uh, the way Iranians feel is extremely uh, difficult for me personally. Uh, but I'll, nevertheless, I'll, I'll give it a try, and you can take it for what it's worth. I think the Iranian people, uh, the vast majority of them, uh, welcome this deal because it will lead to the lifting of sanctions. Sanctions have made their, their lives uh, difficult, uh, have uh, constricted their opportunities, particularly for young people. Uh, and bear in mind, this is, you know, this is Iran. This is a big country with a, with a uh, history as an ancient civilization. Uh, and and uh, very capable people. That's how they managed to build a nuclear program. Great scientific base, uh, culturally, creatively. I mean, they, they have a lot that they could bring that's positive to the world. And I think that a lot of them uh, would like that opportunity. You, you no doubt have read, because this has been in the American press for 10 years, how popular Americans are in Iran, and how popular the United States is in Iran amongst the people, um, because there is this kind of admiration uh, for uh, the American people. So that's on that level, I think there's, there's uh, support for the deal because of the sanctions. By the way, Iran's acquiring a, a nuclear uh, program which would give it the potential to have a nuclear weapon, is also very popular in Iran. Uh, because Iranians see themselves as a significant power, uh, given their population and resources and history. They uh, feel that it's their, their right. Uh, it's a matter of prestige. Pakistan has nuclear weapons uh, next door. Uh, they presume that Israel has nuclear weapons. Uh, Turkey is under you know, NATO's nuclear umbrella. Uh, and so you know, 
they feel as a matter of prestige that they would like to have it, but I think that they would also much prefer to have sanctions lifted uh, than uh, face this uh, continuation of this situation. Uh, when it comes to the regime, I think that the Ayatollah is deeply suspicious of the intentions of the United States. He, and I've heard this from people who have talked to him directly about this, he looks at what happened to Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein. Both of them had nuclear uh, programs. Both of them gave them up uh, and uh, were subjected to international inspections. And in both cases, the United States invaded and toppled them anyway. And he is paranoid uh, about the United States and I think believes that uh, there's great danger in this deal uh, that uh, we will somehow turn around and do the same thing we did to Saddam Hussein and, and uh, Gaddafi if he gives up his nuclear option. If he had, has nuclear weapons, we would be deterred from doing repeating those exercises. So for him, you know, it's, it, it's a question of, well, I'd like to have a nuclear capability to deter the United States and any other of my enemies, but I'd also like to get the sanctions lifted because my people are unhappy and there's a potential that they will overthrow me instead of the United States doing it. Uh, and in you know, the way he kind of weighs it up, he's, I think, been persuaded that he better take care of his people, uh, especially in the context of the Arab revolutions that have taken place as a result of, of similar uh, authoritarian leaders uh, who have failed to uh, take the needs of their people into account. So I think he's going along with it as a kind of grudging, bitter pill. Uh, but then... If I try finally to put myself in, this, in the shoes of the negotiators, <clears throat> excuse me, they had to be able to come home and convince him that even though he'd given up his ability to acquire nuclear weapons, at least for 15 years, uh, nevertheless, they had managed to preserve Iran's nuclear civilian program, which is its right under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And that's why, instead of destroying Fordo, that underground plant, it was reconfigured. Nothing was actually taken down and destroyed. It was, the centrifuges were mothballed. So, you know, when you look at this deal and you say, why didn't they just uh, insist, why didn't we insist that there be no enrichment? Period. Uh, why didn't we insist that Fordo be shut down? Why didn't we insist that uh, there be no Iraq heavy water reactor? Essentially, if you look at the deal, what the negotiators, our negotiators were doing was saying, okay, the Iranians have a red line, which is they have to preserve their civilian nuclear program. So working within that, what do we need what do we need within that to ensure that they aren't able to break out and use that civilian nuclear program to acquire nuclear weapons? That's why the Iraq plutonium reactor had to be reconfigured, because that's the most dangerous path. That's why the president keeps on saying, we have blocked Iran's four paths to acquiring nuclear weapons, which this agreement does. But it does it within the context of Iran being able to exercise its right to have a civilian nuclear program. And, you know, that's Prime Minister Netanyahu's major complaint against this. And the Saudis and others also, they're less vocal about it, also don't like it. But that, you know, diplomacy is the art of the possible. Uh, that's the deal that we could get. We couldn't get a deal in which they had to dismantle their civilian nuclear program. That was beyond uh, the ability of the negotiators. We could bomb them. That would, you know, take care of those facilities. But, you know, then they would be under no obligations and would take them all underground. 
You mentioned briefly what would happen if Congress, uh, if the deal was not um, approved. Uh, but suppose Congress, what, what is the likelihood that Congress won't approve it? And what happens if they don't? OK, we've got to do a little bit of maths, if you'll indulge me. Uh, the first hurdle in the Senate is uh, the cloture, cloture vote. It enables uh, those who want to uh, vote on the deal, uh, vote the deal down, to bring it to the Senate floor. Um, they need 60 votes for that. Uh, the Republicans have 54. Schumer and Menendez have come out uh, against the deal, so they've got two more. Uh, but uh, they're still four short uh, in terms of getting Senate Democrats to cross the line to enable the vote to take place. Uh, if they get those senators, then they need, then they presumably will be able to uh, disapprove the deal. What they're actually disapproving is the United States lifting the sanctions it imposed as part of the international sanctions uh, against Iran's nuclear program. Those are important sanctions because they are the financial sanctions which have stopped uh, Iran being able to deal with basically any bank that wants to do business with the United States. That's the most crippling part of the sanctions. So that's what they'd be voting on if they vote uh, a disapproval. Disapproval of the president's ability to lift those particular sanctions. If they vote it down, they need to vote it down in both houses. Uh, and they may well be able to do that. But then the president has said very clearly he will veto uh, that uh, uh, legislation. And uh, then, in order to override his veto, they will have to get two-thirds majorities in both houses. That means they've got to get 45, assuming all the Republicans vote against it, they have to get 45 Democrats to cross the aisle in the House, and they have to get 13 uh, Democrats to cross the aisle in the Senate. Um, it doesn't look likely that they're going to be able to sustain those numbers. Uh, not impossible, but the way things are developing over the summer, it seems unlikely. Uh, and therefore, the deal will then uh, likely go through. Does that answer the whole question? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Uh, I have a few more uh, details on the deal itself. Uh, just going to tick them off quickly, because then I have some big, broad questions that we want to come to at the end before we close. Uh, one is, is it really true that the Iranians are responsible for the inspections, and then they report to the UN? Maybe you talked about that. Uh, and the other is, uh, what happens to the 14,000 centrifuges uh, that are now disallowed going from 19 to 5? And, uh, no, those are, those are the little... Okay, quickly, on the, the 14,000, they are mothballed. Um, they are not destroyed. That's part of what I was explaining. Uh, they don't get taken out of mothballs until 15 years, but in the case of uh, the, uh, the advanced centrifuges, the Iranians get to work on those centrifuges after year 10. So that by year 15, they will have workable advanced centrifuges that they can put into uh, play and therefore be able to enrich uh, much more efficiently, faster. Uh, and that's part of the problem that I was uh, describing to you before. Now, the issue of uh, uh, the IAEA separate protocol that they, the IAEA has negotiated with the Iranians uh, about past military-related nuclear activity is what's at issue here in this question of the Iranians taking samples. It's about what they did in the past to try to build a nuclear device, nuclear triggers, so on, separate from the enrichment of the material needed to make a bomb. The, so the material needed to make a bomb, as I said, is fully covered, inspected, monitored from mine head through to the, the uh, stockpile. 
in every, every way. It's this question of accounting for what they did in the past. Because the, the argument goes that in order to have a baseline for inspecting and making sure that they don't go down that road again of trying to uh, develop a device, the IAA needs to know what happened. Now, I think there's general consensus, including amongst the Israelis, that they stopped working on those things, those nuclear device designs and triggers, uh, some 10 years ago. So the question is, what happened before that? Uh, from the US point of view, if you read the press, uh, there is this uh, confidence within the administration, and they have briefed the intelligence committees on this, that they know what the Iranians had done 10 years ago that they don't feel the need to go through this accounting process in order to have the baseline to ensure that they don't cheat in the future. But the IAA has its protocols and its way of doing business, so they need to do it. And that's why you see this, this I think, quite awkward and, and um, problematic uh, approach on the part of the administration that they say, well, you know, we know, Secretary Kerry said, absolutely we know. Um, and that, that is, uh, some cre creates unease with people who are on the fence um, because of the sense that the Iranians are already not accounting for things they did that they need to do according to the IAEA. Now, the IAEA has worked out this protocol. I gather, although it's unclear still, but I gather from the reporting that um, that protocol that they worked out separate from the agreement uh, enables the Iranians to do the, sam to do the sampling in the places that the IAEA wants to sample, and then the IAEA gets to test those samples. Doesn't sound like a very sensible way of doing things. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that's exactly accurate. The IAEA is you know, playing possum on this, and I, I don't understand what's going on there. But it is a kind of side part of, of, uh, uh, of the whole package and not critical to the package itself, the main, main part of the package. You might want to duck this, but this question is, which U.S. presidential candidate do you think would be the best at honoring and maintaining the deal? <laughs> when she becomes president. <laughs> and I'm not talking about Carly Fiorina. Um, no. um, I'm, I'm not going to duck it, but I have to... Uh, uh, in the interest of full transparency, I'm, I'm a Clintonist. I've always been a strong um, supporter of the Clintons. Bill Clinton gave me a life-changing opportunity to, to be his Middle East advisor and then sent me twice to Israel. And, and I had the chance to work with Hillary as First Lady and then um, as an advisor to her when she was Secretary of State. And um, you know, I just have uh, great admiration for her and I think she'd make a great foreign policy president. Uh, so the question then is, what about the others? Um, and, you know, it's very interesting that the Republican candidates have been quite careful about what they say about what they would do if they were president. There are two exceptions. <laughs> Mike Huckabee, who said he'll rip it up, and Donald Trump, who said, interestingly, that he doesn't like this deal, he thinks it's a terrible deal. He, of course, would have negotiated a much better deal. <laughs> but he'll live with it and try to find ways to uh, fix it. That was very interesting. And uh, I suspect that even though it's impolitic for them to say it, if any one of them became president, except Mike Huckabee, who's now committed to ripping it up. You know, the Israelis have this saying, it was Ariel Sharon who said it, but I think it's a, it applies in this case. It looks different from here, when you're sitting behind the president's desk, to when you're on the campaign trail trying to win 
election. And when you're looking at the deal, you know, next year, and you will have, there'll be some time to see whether the Iranians are fulfilling their part of the bargain, what they're doing in the rest of the region, how they're behaving. Uh, then, you know, I think that a president, a uh, Republican president, will find it uh, very hard to say, okay, we're going to give up on that and have the Iranians walk away from their part of the deal and go back to enriching uranium and move us back to a crisis. That's the last thing that the next president is going to want in his first, in his first year on the job, assuming that the Iranians are doing their part. There's one... There's one last question here, which is uh, someone wants you to take a poll, a re-poll of the audience to find out if anyone changed their mind after listening to all of this. Before you do that, I just want to thank you once again for a terrific and interesting Thank you very much. I'm not going to take this poll. Thank you. I'm not going to take this poll for two reasons. One, all my supporters are leaving. <laughs> and secondly, the last time I did it, I convinced nobody. In fact, I lost votes. So <laughs> I don't wish to go through that again. Thank you very much.